Ladies and gentlemen, why don't we get started? I want to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelko, and I'm fortunate enough to direct the Environmental Change and Security Program here and uh, coordinate the Global Health Initiative. And it's, um, it's a real thrill for us to have today's session. We appreciate all of you who are still in Washington in June and are here to both present and speak with us, but also to participate as audiences. Um, it's, um, it would be an entirely rational behavior to leave if you could. Um, but it's, it's terrific that you've all come to the center for us to discuss today the role of gender and population health and environment programs. As, uh, seeing many familiar faces, as many of you know, we are uh, here at the Center in the Environmental Change and Security Program in the business of facilitating discussion and dialogue between the worlds of scholarship and research and the worlds of policy and practice. And particularly in the case of uh, the Environmental Change and Security Program, these issues, the population issues, the health issues, the environment issues within a development context, a foreign policy context, and even sometimes a security policy context. And it's terrific today that one of the issues that run through all of these discussions, the gender um, dimension is front and center in terms of how we are um, understanding these integrated challenges in the field and how we are responding to them with, with integrated programs uh, on the ground. A word just about the Wilson Center where we're sitting, and apologies to those of you who've heard it many times. In fact, my staff likes to, to tease me about my, my mantra here. But I do think it's important to stress that we're sitting at the Wilson Center, which is the nonpartisan, non-advocacy forum, um, that is the official memorial to Wilson and is our only president who had a PhD. Instead of building an obelisk that we could go look at in this sweltering heat on the mall, uh, instead we're inside in the um, uh, carbon producing air conditioning uh, trying to <laughs> discuss and debate um, uh, d debate issues where the, the, the scholar and the policymaker can learn from one another and um, difficult public policy issues, but we try to tackle those with um, nearly now 700 meetings a year at the Wilson Center. As many of you know, uh, former Congressman Lee Hamilton is the president and director, and so we are uh, thrilled, and on his behalf, thrilled that you're able to join us. Um, on, on, a, on a more, actually, not a more serious, a very serious note, um, we, uh, chairs of meetings here are now in the last few weeks, unfortunately, having to make the practice of calling to your attention um, uh, the fact that one of our colleagues and dear friends, Hale Esfandiari, who directs our Middle East program, is actually in prison in Tehran for doing exactly what we're doing here today. She has for, um, I think, eight or nine years now been facilitating dialogue among some folks who want to talk and some folks who don't, but nevertheless she always provided a forum on issues particularly um, uh, pertaining to Iran and was a real leader and is a real leader on um, the role of women in the Middle East. And unfortunately, the regime in Iran has seen fit to lock her up and charge her with um, all sorts of uh, falsehoods. And so we are all um, have her in our thoughts, and I urge you to do the same. Uh, so let's get to the specifics of the program. Um, as I said here, the Environmental Change and Security Program, we're about trying to bring these different worlds of pop, health, environment, gender development, foreign policy, security policy, different groups in the room. And I think if you look at the participants list, you'll see that that diversity is here today. Um, we, are, we are, in that sense, embracing the complexity of what we face on the ground rather than compartmentalizing it. And so what we will hear about today with both um, from two experienced people, one working in the population reproductive health area and gender, one working in the natural resource management and gender, how these things are coming together. Um, and then with folks that we all have in the room, we look forward to a dialogue about understanding the practicality and, and the difference that this integration makes. I would like to say thanks, as we do often, for a number of the meetings that we have here and activities at the Center in the Environmental Change Security Program. Thanks to USAID for its support, and in our case, Office of Population and Reproductive Health. And um, they are terrific partners as well as supporters in what we're doing. And so it's great that uh, we've been able to um, uh, collaborate on today's meeting as, as one in those series. So our speakers, we're very pleased to have Karen Hardy and uh, uh, Elin Torrell uh, speaking to us. Karen especially is about to race off to the airport literally right at the end of the meeting. So I know how those days before international trips go and they're not a lot of fun. So we appreciate you coming and sharing your insights with us on the way to the airport. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, Karen is, a, as many of you know, a social demographer with lots of experience in pop development and HIV. She's a senior advisor at John Snow, where she provides technical input to international public health projects related to HIV, reproductive health, family planning. Currently working on a project that focuses on harmonizing data quality tools for multiple donors, including the uh, Global Fund and, and PEPFAR. Uh, as, I, again, many of you know, she previously served as fellow and director at Costello Future Center for Research and Evaluation, directed the Policy Project's global research portfolio, and has, um, over the years, been a co-chair for a number of task forces at uh, USAID's interagency gender working group, so a friend and colleague to many in the room. Uh, Elaine Torell is the Coastal Resources Specialist with the University of Rhode Island's Coastal Resources Center. Uh, her expertise crosses a lot of these areas, including environmental planning, policy development, applied research, M&E, a favorite, again, of many in the room. And over the past five years, she's led a, a number of international projects related to gender, health, and environment. She currently co-leads a USAID-funded Sustainable Coastal Communities and Ecosystems uh, Tanzania program, where she's had special interest and attention to uh, related issues of gender, health, and environment. So Karen, we're going to turn the floor over to you, and again, we look forward to the two presentations, and then we'll have time for Q&A. One reminder to all of you, uh, particularly when we come to Q&A, we are webcasting this session live, um, and so when you have a question, if you can identify yourself and also speak into a microphone that one of my colleagues will bring to you so that the questions are picked up on the web uh, for the live broadcast as well as the archive that will be on our website. So Karen, please, the floor Thank is you. Here. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, all for coming. I feel like I'm giving this presentation really on behalf of a lot of people, and that is because I've had the great opportunity to work with the Interagency Gender Working Group over a number of years. And this was a very collaborative effort out of the uh, USAID's uh, Office of Population and Reproductive Health, and it's been a fabulous opportunity. So what I'm going to be presenting today really is the, the, the basis of it. It really is a very collaborative effort among a number of people. What I want to talk about today is how we in the family planning and reproductive health field talk about gender integration, how we sort of operationalize that, because we wanted this to be very, you know, sort of field oriented and, and, and nuts and bolts oriented. And then I want to talk about a study that we did on the effect of, of integrating gender. We sort of said, so what? You integrate, are we doing anything to integrate gender into our family planning reproductive health programs? And if we are, is it making any difference to outcomes? Is it making any difference to reproductive health outcomes? And is it making any difference to gender outcomes? And then I just want to finish up talking about a, uh, briefly about a policy initiative that uh, we worked on to promote male involvement. So let me start by talking about gender, about gender integration. And we, t we, we, again, as we were talking about integrating gender into programs, we realized that it needed to be very action-oriented. What actions are taken by programs uh, that look at, that, uh, that in the assessment, the design, and the evaluation, that take gender norms into consideration and that compensate for gender-based inequalities, both for women and men. Sometimes there's a tendency to think that gender equals women, and we wanted to get away from that idea that, that if you're working on gender, you're only working to, to sort of improve <coughs> the lot of women. We realized that gender had to include both, both men and women. Well, what do we mean by gender-based uh, inequalities? The, uh, the document that you see on the slide is called A Manual for Integrating Gender into Reproductive Health and HIV Programs, and this is another of the IGWG's uh, documents that's available on the IGWG website. And the authors of this took a lot of time to, to sort of really uh, think through what do we mean by gender norms and inequalities. And we're really talking about gender-based division of labor. So, for example, women's labor, usually domestic chores, may possibly in some cultures not be valued as work, but rather as a natural part of being a woman and therefore not really work, and therefore uh, not work that needs to be reduced in order to aid uh, women's reproductive health. Likewise, if men are, are men's work may preclude, or the time that men's work takes may preclude them also accessing health services, reproductive health services. So the division of labor can have um, implications for reproductive health. Gender norms and roles. 
uh, gender norms that, that promote fertility as a way to establish status both for women and for men contribute to pressure that both women and men may feel to have, to have, uh, to have children, to get pregnant again and maybe more times than they want to get pregnant because of social pressure, gender-based pressure to have more children. So gender norms and the power and decision-making inequalities suggest that it's not a woman's right in some cultures, not a woman's right to refuse sex with her partner and also promotes the idea that it's a man's right to force his partner to have sex or to, and to beat her if she refuses. Uh, access to control over resources. Access is the ability to use resources. Control is the ability to define and make decisions about the use of resources. So a common example for, uh, for just for example, is that a woman may have access to income, but she may not have, be able to make decisions about how that money is actually used, including for reproductive health. And finally, power and decision making. Gender inequalities and power and decision making make it difficult, as I said earlier, for women to refuse sex with their partners, and also make it difficult to advocate for changes in the household, for changes, for example, related to division of labor. So we operationalized uh, for, for re our purposes of reproductive health that these are the gender-based norms and inequalities that need to be addressed in programs that integrate gender to change reproductive health outcomes. So now I want to talk about this study. And it, this is a study, again, that was sponsored by the uh, Interagency Gender Working Group. And it's, uh, the, the copy of the report and also a summary is on the IGWG website. It's called the, the So What Report. Um, and again, as I was saying earlier, what we wanted to say, see was, is, does it make any difference to integrate gender into reproductive health programs? So for this study, we identified documents through databases and journals of reproductive health and development. And we also contacted about 170 uh, individuals who work in the area of gender and reproductive health to see if they knew of any studies that perhaps were ongoing but hadn't been published, perhaps were in the, what we call the gray literature. Um, 66 of, of these people were able to offer suggestions. In all, we reviewed about 400 reproductive health interventions, which included reproductive health programs, development programs that had a reproductive health component, uh, clinical trials of contraceptives or other reproductive health products, and operations research studies. And the criteria to be included were that the interventions had to have measured reproductive health outcomes, and these uh, outcomes fell into five areas, unintended pregnancy, maternal morbidity and mortality, STIs, HIV and AIDS, and quality of care. Uh, and also, we also looked at gender-based violence, but that part of the study became its own document, so I'm not gonna be talking about the gender-based violence um, interventions, although of course they're very important. And male involvement was included in each of these five main categories. We didn't have a separate category called male involvement. And it wasn't necessary for these programs to have measured gender outcomes. Of course, that would be preferable, and, and some did. Um, but they had to have gone systematic evaluation, either a quant preferably qu quantitative but qualitative evaluation, as long as it was systematic and well-documented. And the interventions had to have done something to integrate, to integrate gender. So uh, we looked at, well, this, is, this is sort of the, uh, the IGWG gender continuum. It's become the IGWG gender continuum. We looked at three types of, of, uh, of gender integration. The first is transforming gender relations to promote equity. And that, this really is looking at all of the dimensions of gender inequality that we talked about in the previous slide. And these are strategies that are, that are attempt to overcome gender-related barriers to reproductive health by shifting the balance of power, the distribution of resources or the division of labor, the duties between men and women on the basis of the, of the project um, and also between women and service providers. And they also work to build critical awareness of those gender norms. So this is, these are the, this is the type of gender inter, in, integration interventions that we actually looked at in our assessment. A second type was accommodating gender differences and that is that's to say, okay, we know that there are gender differences, we know that the, the duties of men and women are different, and we're going to accommodate our services, for example, to offer childcare at service delivery so that a woman can still fulfill her gender-related duties, and we're going to accommodate that 
in our service delivery practices. Another example is bringing contraceptives to what they call, what we call bringing into the doorstep. So in countries where women's movement outside the home is, is, is difficult, a way of accommodating those gender norms is to bring contraceptives, bring family planning services, reproductive health services to the doorstep. And the third type uh, is what we call exploiting gender inequalities. And this is using, sort of reinforcing or strengthening uh, gender inequalities, for example, and using them to promote family planning and reproductive health services. So for example, there might be a, a using, using sort of violent images of sex in advertising to, to try and reach men, for example, is, is, is something that might exacerbate uh, gender inequalities. So we didn't want to look at the first two because the, the purpose, the purpose of, of our work in gender was really to transform gender, gender relations and promote equity. So of, all, of the 400 interventions, we found 29 that integrated gender by tr seeking to transform gender relations to promote equity. Nine of these were uh, related to unintended pregnancy family planning, uh, three related to maternal mor mor mortality, morbidity, 10 related to STI, HIV, AIDS, and three related to quality of care. Um, and of the target groups, all of the interventions included women, 14 included men, and four focused on, on youth. This is just a table to show you um, where the, I realize also I got group and target uh, mixed up on this slide, I just realized that. Uh, anyway, so, so you can see that the family planning ones were much more likely to include women and men than were the, any of the, any, well, the maternal mortality and morbidity, because there were only three, two of them included men and women, um, than the STI, HIV, and the quality of care just uh, only, only included women. You can see that, uh, that these were studies that were really uh, across, we, 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 we tried to find studies that were in developing countries. We included one from North America, and the ones in parentheses are, are countries in which there were more than, there was more than one intervention, maybe in one of the, maybe, you know, one in family planning, one in SCI, for example. So we have a pretty good mix. And this is just to show you the list of the family planning interventions, um, that, that they really were a mix of reaching husbands, reaching youth, uh, adolescent mothers reaching uh, women to help them diagnose in Peru and, and that they were uh, sort of throughout the world. So getting to the outcomes, again we looked at re does ge integrating gender make any difference to reproductive health outcomes and we also said does it make any difference to gender outcomes. And so this, this slide just shows the reproductive health outcomes that we found in the 29 interventions. Most of the positive changes were related to knowledge and attitudes, not surprisingly, rather than behavior. However, increases in knowledge and changes in, in attitudes we think are a good precursor to changes in behavior and changes related to gender norms. Among the interventions to reduce unintended pregnancy, six showed uh, an increase in family planning use, that's behavior, and five had an increase in contraceptive knowledge. Among the interventions to reduce more, more maternal mortality or morbidity, four showed an increase in using skilled attendants at birth, and three, an increase in understanding the warning signs of pregnancy. And of the STI, uh, of the interventions to reduce STI, HIV, and AIDS, 10 increased knowledge, and three achieved a decrease in STI rates. So moving on to the gender outcomes, again, it, the, the same thing that most of the, most of the changes in, in outcomes were in attitudes rather than behavior. Uh, I think one of the things that we all know from our projects is sometimes the, the project cycle is so short that it's really hard to measure behavioral outcomes uh, in, 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 uh, in some of our interventions. So that could, that could also be going on um, in, our, in our findings, but still pretty clear that attitudes are more likely to change with these, in, with these uh, interventions than, than is behavior. What I want to do is just very quickly run through one of the studies, and this was looking at husbands and post-abortion care in Egypt, just to sort of show you the, the kind of analysis that we did. So in Egypt, one in five admissions to public sector OBGYN hospitals were due to post-abortion care uh, spontaneous and, and in, uh, induced. And after returning home, many women resumed domestic duties before having had enough time to fully recover. So the, the strategy then was to try in the counseling with women who've had post their post-abortion care was also to talk to the men, to counsel the partners in individual counseling sessions 
if the, assuming that the woman agreed that her hus that her husband or partner should be counseled, the, the husbands were taken aside by the doctors and counseled separately. So a post-test only control group was used to evaluate the intervention. Third, and 30 days after a woman's discharge from the hospital, she re responded to a survey measuring a weakness index, a psychological distress index, and three facets of husband support. Uh, physical support, in, called instrumental physical support, emotional support, and family planning support. So the outcomes suggest that good physical recovery of women uh, experiencing post-abortion post women was associated with the husband's counseling at an um, odds ratio of 1.3. And the husband's counseling also had a positive effect on contraceptive use at, uh, in, in the, where the intervention was done in smaller hospitals and where training of the physicians was more thorough. And this was a, showed an odds ratio of 3.8. Husbands in both the intervention and control group were less likely to provide instrumental support to their wives than emotional support. And th this is an interesting finding, in instrumental meaning sort of material or sort of physical support. And this is probably, again, related to those gender norms and roles that men aren't supposed to, uh, you know, that, they, that it was hard for them to take on duties to help their wives physically uh, post-abortion. And, and it could be possibly that, you know, mothers-in-law or somebody gave, you know, gave those husbands a hard time for trying to take on some of those physical, physical activities. So that's sort of an interesting finding. Uh, the logistic regression analysis revealed that counseled husbands were 1.5 times more likely to provide higher than average instrumental support to their wives, 1.3 times more likely to provide emotional support, and 1.6 times more likely to provide family planning support. So very, so very, good, uh, very good outcomes. So the 29 studies we reviewed this way, we looked at the, what the intervention was, how they integrated gender, what the, what the outcomes were. So just to, just to uh, talk about uh, what we concluded in this analysis, and I should say that, uh, that there were a lot of activities, interventions that were ongoing at the time that we did this a couple of years ago that hadn't been, they hadn't, uh, they, they weren't far enough along to have been evaluated yet. And so we're actually hoping that we can redo this analysis to see now, a couple of years later, if there are actually more interventions that we could, that we could include in this documentation. Uh, but what we found was that those interventions that did work to integrate gender to transform gender relations really did report positive reproductive health outcomes. But we also found that it was actually very hard to get much documentation of the, how much gender had actually been, been integrated and that very few of the, of the programs, as we said, only 29 out of 400 actually uh, measured gender impact so, so that uh, it was just not measured enough. But where it was measured, it had a, a very positive, uh, positive out gender outcomes, gender norm change outcomes. Um, it, we also found that gender concerns have received, not surprisingly, with, uh, with AIDS, a lot of att more attention in AIDS prevention work due to the very transparent link between gender and HIV, more so than in, than, than, you know, in, the, in the first years of the family planning movement, certainly. Um, so, so we did find that there was, there was a lot of attention in, in HIV interventions for gender. Um, what we also found that sometimes it was hard to sort of separate out what might be the gender impact because a lot of these programs used a community participation um, strategy and so it was hard to tease out what the impact of that was versus the impact on, of, of focusing on gender norms. Um, as I said, few of the reproductive health programs that, w that integrated gender were, were well enough evaluated for us even to include, um, and that isolating the effect of gender perspective is, is difficult, again, because especially post-Cairo, a lot of these interventions are sort of multi-sectoral, uh, multi-component, so it's hard to tease out what the impact of just one component is on the programs. So now I just want to spend a few minutes talking about a policy initiative to promote male, male involvement because I know that it, there's a lot of interest in, in what are we doing to, to, to include men. And there are actually a lot of very, I know there was a, actually a session just here and maybe it was in one of the other programs looking at, looking at male involvement and promoting responsible male, uh, constructive male involvement um, in, in reproductive health programs. There's uh, excellent programs in Brazil looking at taking sort of adolescent boys and trying to change their norms and, and attitudes and helping them to realize what those norms do to their own reproductive health in addition to the reproductive health of their, of their partners or potential partners. But there hasn't been quite as much on policy, so I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about a policy initiative. Um, 
but of course, since I worked on the policy project for many years, it <laughs> was uh, of great interest um, and something that I was also also involved in. Um, and this was a, a looking at, at making male involvement, moving a male involvement policy forward in Cambodia. Um, and these are just the colleagues that uh, that, that that worked on it with me. Um, so there's been a general tendency to enjoy, endorse gender equality and particularly male involvement internationally, but little has been done in policies, in national policies, to promote the potential role of men uh, in these endeavor in these endeavors. Um, some some notable exceptions have been Uganda, Museveni with the AIDS uh, crisis in Uganda very early promoted gender equity as part of their of Uganda's uh, successful strategy. Guatemala has a 2001 laws on social development and population that calls for gender equality and addresses responsible parenthood. Jamaica's national youth policy re, uh, addresses the, the sort of gender imbalance that affects males in that country even more so than females in labor statistics, educational statistics, it's, uh, crime statistics, uh, so, that, so that the Jamaica's youth policy really promotes constructive um, you know, attention to, to, to men. Um, nearly a third of children in Costa Rica had been previously unrecognized by their father. Costa Rica has a law that is a responsible fatherhood law, and Botswana's family planning policy and guidelines has very good uh, standards, norms and standards for um, integrating men into service delivery. Um, so why is it important to promote policies? We think it's important to promote policies because it's one way to make sure that, that uh, that, that programs move beyond sort of pilot projects to having the potential to national scale up. Um, the guidelines can define approaches and increase program consistency around objectives and strategies of, of working with men. You can have broader uh, uh, objectives in programs. The policies can help set the, ground, the, set the groundwork for those broader strategies. Um, and also to facilitate multi-sectoral implementation. If the policies are multi-sectoral, it's easier than the, to have that kind of approach than, uh, than if there are no policies and then it becomes a much more of a sectoral, sectoral approach. So in Cambodia, the, uh, the, uh, uh, what's called the Reproductive Health Promotion Working Group um, in 2003 uh, identified the reproductive health issues that it wanted to work on and it decided that its primary advocacy objective was to work on, on increasing um, men's participation in reproductive health. So this, this working group was, um, was had a comprise of 17 members um, that, that got together and, and uh, in 2004, after lots of discussion, prioritized re uh, men's reproductive health as their, first, as their first issue. International donors, USAID and UNFPA provided through, uh, through the policy project and others technical assistance to this group to uh, um, learn more about how to do advocacy, learn more about um, policies, writing policies, doing stu requisite studies, et cetera, et cetera. The IG, through the IGWG, we were able to tap into training and, and some of the manuals that, I, that I've even shown you in this presentation that were a really big help in developing these policies. And the Ministry of Health in Cambodia that uh, played a really important role in, in understanding early on the importance of this issue. <coughs> But these initiatives take time, and you can see that uh, you know over sort of over a three-year period that the uh, the group was formed, that they did um, they did a lot of stakeholder meetings, and they um, sort of garnered broad-based support through through that kind of a process where there were multiple stakeholder meetings, multiple studies that were done, evidence pr presented. Um, to finally, to 2005, 2006, where there was a key informant study and a workshop to actually sort of a multi-sectoral workshop to draft the guidelines, and the res with the result being a male involvement guidelines that were referenced in the National Strategic Plan for Reproductive Health in Cambodia that covers, the, covers 2006 to 2010. Uh, of course, it's never enough just to have a policy, and so we need we need increasing attention to uh, to implementation of the policy in Cambodia, um, and and further funding, of course, further funding again to operationalize and, and implement the policy. Um, and but based on this uh, activity in Cambodia, this experience in Cambodia, the the um, follow-on to the policy project, the health policy initiatives. 
um, USAID funded project is actually uh, working in Mali on, on male involvement policy activities, so an important thing. I just want to finish by saying that just sort of putting in a plea, uh, at least for in our field, reproductive health, uh, which of course from Cairo we say is uh, reproductive health, family planning, HIV, maternal health, I mean really all of it, uh, that we just need much more integration of gender in the design of program interventions. And not just integration, but documentation of what the, of what the integration is so that when it's evaluated, you know what you're evaluating. And of course, much more vigorous evaluations of these interventions. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. So maybe have you guys switch seats so that yeah, you guys no can see that and get the thing off the back. So. so technology will fail. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now we'll switch gears, I guess, and um, I'm going to give you a brief <coughs> presentation of some of our experiences from uh, integrating gender into coastal management in Tanzania. I'll start by giving you a little introduction to the Coastal Resources Center where I work and uh, our philosophy to coastal management. Then I'll talk a little bit about the Tanzanian context and the gender strategies that we've used in Tanzania. And then I'll give you just three brief examples of instances where we've tried to mainstream gender. So the Coastal Resources Center has worked on coastal management issues um, for about 30 years now, internationally for maybe 20 years. And we work in Latin America, East Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, and in Rhode Island, where the center is located. And our goal with coastal management is to improve the quality of life for people who live in coastal areas and at the same time maintain the biological diversity of coastal resources. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we believe in very participatory planning, so to try to empower both men and women who are using coastal resources it goes hand in hand with the two first objectives. And we feel very strongly that you can't just go for one of these goals. You kind of have to approach them uh, simultaneously. You can't have just biological diversity if you don't try to improve the lives of um, the poor people who are living in the areas where we work. So when we uh, go in and work in a, in a place, because most of our work is place-based on the ground in communities, we usually uh, work to develop a plan or a strategy or something Sometimes it's marine protected areas. Sometimes, like in Tanzania, we developed a national strategy for coastal management. Um, we often develop sustainable livelihoods, uh, and then we also work with uh, bigger investors in developing investment guidelines, like this uh, guidelines for uh, tourism development in Tanzania. And we usually do some sort of capacity building uh, of local stakeholders and also uh, policymakers. Now, since about 2000, uh, we've we've initiated these cross-cutting themes, and uh, gender and health are, I think, the most important ones. With health being a little bit newer, and w in health we're focusing mainly on HIV/AIDS. So CRC has been working in Tanzania since about 1997. And we have one long-term program that has been going on since then, which is the Success Tanzania Project, where we uh, developed the strategy that I mentioned, and we're now implementing it through uh, district action planning and through um, uh, collaborative fisheries management, livelihood development, and all kinds of activities. And the three other projects are smaller projects that are linking uh, into the bigger one. The last one, which we call the Peace Initiative, is the Population Equity, AIDS, and Coastal Ecosystems Project. It's actually ended now, but it was funded by USAID Washington, and it had been merged into uh, the Bigger Success Project. But that was the first time we explicitly tried to mainstream gender and AIDS uh, into our project. 
So in Tanzania, we find that they're really deeply embedded inequalities, and especially on the coast where you have uh, Muslim communities, women are much less likely to go to school. Maybe they'll go to primary school, but uh, fewer girls go to secondary school. Few women are in politics. The only ones you see, because you see some, but they're usually from relatively privileged families. Uh, women have very little access to income. And even though they are the ones who kind of run the household, they don't have a whole lot of decision-making power. Uh, the men decide usually who's moving, who's, um, what people are working on, what kind of expenditures you use on health care and stuff like that. But women do control some resources. Uh, women are usually the ones that uh, do perform agriculture. They collect firewood and, and water. And they do a lot of the resource use in the intertidal areas. For example, they are primarily the ones that grow seaweed. They're primarily the ones that uh, glean shellfish and stuff. Now, men also do stuff in the intertidal areas. So I'm not saying that women control it alone. but they have some control over these areas. And we find that this was an important thing for us to learn when, when we're trying to integrate gender because one of our conclusions is that um, when involving women is easier when you somehow is dealing with the resources that they, they do have some control over. And I'll get back to that. Um, so in the, just wanted to uh, mention some of the conclusions that we have about gender and HIV AIDS. And uh, as you heard already, poverty and inequality are major drivers in <coughs> HIV AIDS and it often leads women to unsafe sex. One of the conclusions or one of the findings that we had from the peace initiative was that in Tanzania, women are usually the ones that buy fish. So they buy fish to sell in the market. But in many places, there is no established market for them to buy the fish in. So they have to go to the fishing camps to, to purchase the fish. And a lot of times, the men won't allow them to buy the fish unless they have sex with the fishermen first. So it's kind of just an entry to buy the fish. Um, and that was astounding to us. We had no idea. And now our project is then working to establish some fish markets in some open areas because they feel that if if everything is going on in the open, then men can't put those demands. Um, we all know that women are more likely to uh, become infected. And when women, um, when someone in the household is sick, then women are usually the ones who have to be the caregivers. So they're kind of doubly hit. Um, we found that in the place where we work, this kind of increases the women's pressure to earn a cash income. And a lot of times, they take to uh, misuse of resources. Uh, for example, it, we work around a national park called the Satani National Park in Tanzania. And a lot of women, <coughs> um, and men for that matter, um, cut wood in the park to make charcoal because that's a quick way of getting money. So in Tanzania, we have three objectives with uh, mainstreaming gender. And one is to overcome gender-based barriers to resource management. Just, we just assume that if we can get both women and men to participate in our planning, the results will be better. The second objective is to increase women's engagement in livelihoods, because we feel if we can improve the access to, to income to women, their lives will be will just be better. And the third objective is kind of an um, indirect one is HIV prevention. So some of the action strategies that we've used is uh, to develop gen gender sensitive policies. So the, for example, the, we've developed some guidelines for district action planning and we try to, throughout the document, um, show how you can mainstream gender applied some gender analysis methods um, and participatory planning, like just holding meetings when women can participate, um, conduct trainings at national district and village level on the importance of thinking about gender, uh, 
require some minimum levels of women's participation in committees and collect and analyze gender disaggregated data. And uh, we find that just by very simple monitoring, we learn some things. For example, we have one initiative to help women um, grow paprika for or paprika around the Sadan National Park because paprika doesn't get eaten by wild animals so it's a good crop and, and it might help them get an income. Well we just sent a whole group of people to training and when we got back the data on who went to the training I think 70 percent of the people who went to the training were men so it raised a red flag to us. This is a an initiative where we're trying to help women and 70% of the participants were men. So we start to discuss with um, our colleagues in Tanzania, what, how did this happen and stuff. So, and as I said, we're promoting livelihood development where we uh, work with Finke International to provide microloans and where we're promoting female owned businesses. In gender and HIV AIDS, we work with this local NGO in Tanzania called Uzi Kwasa, who are doing um, something called theater for development, where we go into the villages and we play out scenarios um, that we uh, discovered, like the problem of women fishermen, or, uh, fishmongers having to have sex with the fishermen. And together with the audience, we try to find solutions. We're educating villages, uh, village leaders and ward leaders as I said before, we're doing livelihoods. But in, in this specific uh, instance, we're trying to do um, less labor-intensive livelihoods that families that are impacted by AIDS can uh, participate in. And we're doing some energy-saving technologies like fuel-efficient stoves because of knowing that families that are struck by AIDS will have less time and, and stuff so to help them and also reduce the pressure on the, on the park so I have three case studies from Tanzania. Uh, one is from Zanzibar, the Fumba Peninsula. Uh, one is about seaweed farming from Lingotini, which is north of Dar es Salaam. And the last one is uh, about collaborative fisheries management in Mukuranga, which is just south of Dar es Salaam. So on Fumba in, in, on Zanzibar, women uh, usually or traditionally collect bivalves, that's mussels and oysters and, and things like that, just in, in the intertidal areas. And um, they've been doing that for, for a long time. And they've slowly depleted the resources so they have to go further and further out to collect them. And it's not a sustainable wild harvest. So we uh, introduced half pearl farming as an alternative um, to see if you know, you can raise their income by doing this half pearl farming. And that's basically you put a little sand, grain of sand into a pearl or a, into an oyster and it forms a mother of pearl on top and then you can cut it out and you can put it in a piece of jewelry. And it looks like a real pearl, but it's actually only a half pearl. Um, but it's a lot easier to do than making a, a full pearl. And together with the hot half uh, pearl farming, we did a zoning scheme to control the wild harvest. So for the women themselves to kind of limit when they would collect in certain areas. And we're seeing already that the, the resources are improving and the women themselves, as you can see in the photo, is, are helping with the, with the monitoring program. And to both do the half pearl farming and all of this, there were some cultural norms we had to overcome. One simple one is that s women don't swim. And to do half for farming, you have to be a little further offshore. So you kind of have to walk up to here. And then there are these different things. So you have to swim around. But they were really interested. So a colleague and I, we did some swimming lessons. Like she did the first one. And then they were practicing while we were away. And then we came back. And they're swimming now. And they're doing it. So And the half pearls are, are growing. And it seems successful. So. What's interesting about this example is that the women are in control the whole, all of the whole way, because it's their resource that they, you know, were working on, and they're doing the livelihood and the zoning scheme and, and everything. The second example is about seaweed farming, and in this area, uh, seaweed farming used to be very, very low income, 
hardly even worth it, and uh, women only. And they were growing the seaweed on the low, on the flats, like you see in the second photo. And what we did was we introduced a new species that is much more difficult to grow, and it's easier to grow it if you grow it on these lo in these little uh, rectangular rafts and a little bit offshore. And to do this required that you go out on a boat, which women usually don't do in Tanzania. So we kind of tried to say, well, can we try it as a household activity where men and women collaborate? So they tried it, and it seemed to be quite successful. But the problem was that once we put the rafts out, fishermen thought that these rafts were really good fish aggregating devices, so they would come and they would fish under the rafts and they would destroy them. So we, again, introduced the zoning program where we tried to work with all the, both groups and saying, where can the fishing boats go and where could we have the rafts? And uh, again, that has been quite successful, so the conflicts are resolved. And, and we're showing in an economic analysis we did recently that seaweed farmers are actually less vulnerable than some of the other coastal uh, people that are, aren't seaweed growers because they have this added income. Now the last example is about collaborative fisheries management planning. And here we work with people that uh, live in different villages but that are using the same coral reefs. <coughs> we get them together and discuss the, how the resources are doing and, and, and what illegal methods might be, using, be used in the villages and stuff. And together, the villages then decide to do some voluntary r fisheries restrictions. For example, to close a reef temporarily or, or restrict the use of certain gears. And uh, we've done this in several places. And then once the, the rules are in place and they're um, legally binding through village bylaws that are approved by the districts, then the villagers themselves monitor their reefs and they also do the patrolling and stuff. And in this initiative, we tried also to mainstream gender and say, well, this is, you know, could this be an activity that men and women do together, the monitoring and participating in this planning? But we only really got men to be involved. I think <coughs> in our meetings, usually we've had maybe 15 to 20 percent women come. And we tried to figure out why, why is this? And our conclusion is that it's because we're only talking about the practical offshore fisheries here, and it's the men who are fishing. So the, the women don't really find it all that interesting or useful to participate in this planning exercise. So <coughs> maybe if we had made it the planning uh, exercise broader to so somehow in involve the people who buy fish and stuff, may maybe more women would have been involved. So as I said before, what we found is that uh, incorporating a gender lens will lead to a greater participation of men and women when you deal with resources that women control or resources that women and men control together. Mm -hmm. And we find that livelihoods are very good because they do reduce vulnerability of the households, but they don't necessarily change resource use behavior. Uh, when we do the seaweed farming, it doesn't reduce fisheries pressure, for example. Uh, to create the dialogue is, is critical because like, the theater for development has been great as a forum for people really to discuss problems and come up with solutions. And also these um, zoning uh, programs that we've done that have been very participatory have been able to solve some conflicts and like with the seaweed fisheries conflict, it has, it, it has gotten women and men to discuss these problems and, and, and be, get practical solutions. And that combining strategies, like the livelihoods and the zoning, have been, for us, the most successful ways of changing resource use behavior and involve both women and men. So that's my presentation. <coughs> Thank you. Well, thank you both very much. It obviously gives us 
a lot to think about and a lot to work with for, for discussion where we have kind of clear examples of some um, research from efforts on the ground across different studies and particularly in Tanzania where we both are seeing the gender and the population family planning programs integration and the environment and uh, gender natural resource management and gender and particularly HIV um, integration and for for us here at the center where we have been trying to facilitate these lessons learned and field-based experiences in pop health and environment, it is often um, a challenge to find programs that have this kind of perfect integration of all, all your initials plus gender and such. And so part of how we wanted to try to um, focus this discussion then was to see really develop programs that have results that can be discussed and see about higher levels of uh, um, women's participation, higher level of men's participation and the relevant ones and try to uh, understand from these two examples and then the rich experience in the audience how this, um, how the explicit gender dimension uh, can be a, a tool and something explicit, something we need to make explicit to understand its impact but also to make some of these PHE programs uh, more successful. And so that's where we'd love to have the discussion from from uh, all of you, a group that in some cases are very explicitly doing PHE and integrated work and um, sometimes very explicitly including gender, sometimes not. Some of you are coming just straight from the pop and reproductive health world uh, without much interaction with the, um, the E world, the environment or natural resource. And then the flip side, some of you just coming from the natural resources side and, and, and much less so on the pop side. So we have that mix intentionally. Uh, in part so that we can learn from, from each other about how these different sectors uh, do and don't work together. Certainly they play together in the real world and so how our programs in some ways have to reflect that reality. Um, so yes, let's uh, start right in the middle please. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Um, I just had a question. Uh, oh, I'm St my name is Steven Satime. I work with the Global Health Bureau in the POP office in um, policy evaluation communication. Um, I'm wondering if when you're introducing these uh, programs that have a gender um, balance to them, when women start, if you notice that when women start to cross traditional gender boundaries because of uh, their uh, traditional roles in society, if, you, if there were any noticeable increases in the incidences of violence against women? That's a very good question. Um, let me get a sense of uh, kind of questions right away. Why don't we take that one and maybe a, a after time when people really, the juices start flowing, we'll take a couple at a time. Start with the one that you Either of you have? Well, I can just answer quickly because I have asked this question and no one has said anything about it. Everyone says no, no, it hasn't had any impact on, on family-based uh, violence or violence against women. But <coughs> it's nothing that we've we haven't researched it very well either. So I've asked it kind of offhand, you know, I, because I'm interested in it myself. And you mentioned that was one uh, one part of the overall study, but not a focus of today's presentation, but a spin on. Right, just love, but but not so much. I don't know. Um, Deanna, not so much looking at when when gender norms are changed related to reproductive health, if that increases uh, gender-based violence. I think we do know that as women gain more control over resources, then there sometimes there can be a bit of an of an up, upswing in, in violence, but then but then it tends to get reduced. Yeah, Deanna. I would agree, and I think that, mo that it hasn't really been tracked as much in right. a lot of these programs, so I think part of it is just has that question been asked. But there are, there was an example coming from Peru, the Repro Salud uh, project, and some of the work that was done there with women in the community, um, and really trying to work with women in articulating their own reproductive health needs, in organizing around that, in really um, understanding more fully the type of services that were available. And as that continued, and they became, I think, much more empowered and, and being able to, to meet in these different groups, it came from them that, if not violence, there were some questions when they would go back home with this additional information and knowledge. 
and really to be able to fully act upon that knowledge, they were the ones that said, we need you to bring in our partners. We need you to mm -hmm. talk to our husbands about this and make sure that they're a part of this information because sometimes it's difficult to carry that knowledge back into the household if there isn't that support. So that's the kind of thing that maybe is found in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, and the uh, um, Eileen, the conflict with the seaweed farming, uh, presumably because the seaweed farming was family and both male and females, men and women doing that, it, the, the conflict then didn't break on gender <coughs> grounds, but broke between the different sectors <coughs> and didn't play into that? Yeah. Well, even though we've made it a um, kind of a household activity, it's so still like 80% women and 20% men. So it, did, it is a little bit of a gender conflict, but uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's between the livelihoods. Mm -hmm. Judy? Hi, I'm Judy Oglethorpe from World Wildlife Fund. Um, thank you both very much for these presentations. It was really interesting. I wanted to respond to one point of Ilan's on um, y you know, trying to take pressure off fisheries by developing alternative livelihoods. And we've also worked well in various parts of East Africa on developing alternative livelihoods. We've done seaweed farming with women, which had no impact on fisheries, and uh, you know, handicrafts with women in, in Kenya. Um, and I think it, it's great to in improve, w you know, livelihoods with women's activities because then the money gets back into the household and it benefits children and education and health and all the rest of it. But, but we found that it didn't actually affect the fishing very much. For us, what turned the fishing pressure around, um, at least in Kenya, um, and this was in a community which is very uh, conflicted with a, with a marine reserve that was gazetted with no community consultation, so there was a lot of conflict over this. The community was very resentful of the project coming in and trying to reduce pressure on fisheries. The thing that I think really turned this um, conflict around was introducing health to the community so that the community realized that actually Kenya Wildlife Service and, and WWF didn't just care about biodiversity, but actually cared about the people as well. There was also um, an education program that educated both boys and girls, it gave scholarships to, to kids from very poor families, and that that tremendously changed attitudes as well. So with that, we were able to sort of get the fishermen to agree to exchange their fishing nets, which had tiny, tiny mesh and was catching very young fish, for legal-sized mesh, which was bigger, and so the small fish escaped. And they actually, once they started using these nets, they liked them because actually it was less work to pull the fish in because there was less bycatch. Um, so that became a win-win, but the only reason that we could really get through to the fishermen and, 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 and get them to change was when we'd done these other health and education programs. Thanks, Thanks Judy. And can I, where's Heather? Heather, can you say a word about the Philippines? Because the experience that, that we saw there, at least the iPopcorn program, the marine sanctuary and the seaweed farm, kind of a combination, obviously an integrated program, but that did seem to have impacts on fish and lessen the pressure on the natural resource this integrated program. Again, which part of it caused that? But do you want to comment on any similarities or differences that have that? By Sure. Uh, I'm Heather Diagnes, and I am the Population Environment Technical Advisor at USAID's Office of Population. And <coughs> in a previous life, I worked on an integrated population and coastal resource management project, which is the one that Jeff is talking about. And in that case, um, the population uh, that was integrated the activities that were integrated were purely family planning, information, and service provision. Um, but in that case, women were engaged in both the population activities, but also the coastal resource management activities, much in the same way as we saw in the Peace Project in Tanzania. Um, they were resource managers and users, um, and also they were engaged in the management committees. Um, but I think what really worked in that case, especially in the case you're talking about, Jeff, where there was seaweed farming in a zoned area and there was also a marine protected area, was that <coughs> the women um, were the ones who were really working side by side with the men in the community, e equal partners, I would say, in, in trying to decide which zones would be set up and where the seaweed farming would occur and where the fishing would occur uh, and where the marine protected area would be put. And I think having that dialogue between them um, really, there was no conflict in that area, and in fact, the seaweed farming really took off and was um, a livelihood that even um, was more important than the fishing in the end in that area. So I would say that it was it was more the engagement of both 
um, men and women in making management decisions. And I, the only reason that the women were interested, I think, in being a part of that management decision in that context was because they were engaged in the project on the reproductive health side. So that was an entry point for them to get into the management. Terrific. Thank you, Heather. Interesting differences. Charlie? Uh, Charles Teller from uh, Global Health Fellows Program. Um, now that we're sharing uh, experiences uh, on resource and uh, reproductive health in Africa, I have two uh, short ones. One is in, uh, in Zanzibar. I happen to be doing, a, well, through my daughter's uh, relationships uh, there, uh, trying to follow uh, the source of power, uh, gender differentials and sources of uh, control of resources and sources of power. And I think one dimension that you may not have uh, stressed enough is kinship. Uh, and I think that when you stress the win-win situation, when it's you're looking at gender both from win-win uh, looking at the respective uh, roles in seaweed farming. I mean, you know, if you ever tried to yourself do seaweed farming, you know how heavy that seaweed is. Mm -hmm. You do have to have men to help, or at least the boys, help in bringing that in from the tidal area in and then also sell it. Um, but I think that the kinship, what's interesting in the Muslim in Muslim kinship, these are polygamous, polygamous women, and the f and uh, there are a lot of uh, half step brothers, but the f but the uh, but the sons of the 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 woman uh, support her, work for her. They do not work necessarily for the father. So there it is that that type of relationship. And if you don't understand that kinship, those uh, many uh, shall we call mini enterprises, and and the, she controls that. She controls her her uh, sons, uh, even uh, often through marriage. The other is in in Ethiopia when <coughs> they they changed. They, they, there was a land reform in the very traditional northern highlands in Amhara region, where they gave divorced and widowed women uh, control of the land if their husband died through war or through HIV AIDS or whatever. The problem is that women cannot plow and you have to plow to be productive in the highlands. Um, and you cannot sell or rent the land. So they found a solution, which was a win-win, where they did relax the code that uh, women could actually uh, rent out the land uh, to, p to men who could plow, but the woman would still be in control of how the production was distributed and sold. So I think there are these win-win situations. You take that into account. Great, thanks, Charlie. Mm -hmm. Liz, gather up a couple of these. Um, hi, I'm Elizabeth Schenecker from USAID's Office of Population. And I'm interested, um, I guess, in the question of how one um, increases the number of projects that actually have gender as a major focus. And so my question is for both of you. Karen, of course, knows that we made gender a major focus in the policy projects by design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I think we're doing better at that, but it's still relatively few projects that, that have that kind of major focus. So, Elon, I was wondering, how did it come to be a major focus in the work you were doing? Was it there by design from the beginning? Or did you find as you went along that it was something that you had to deal with in order to work effectively? And, you know, looking toward the future, um, what, what's the best way to actually have this happen? Yep. I just wanted first to respond to your um, comment about the seaweed. One of the problems we found, we were trying, we we're working on seaweed in many places in Tanzania, and we're trying to get the women to increase the number of lines they put in the water, but they'll only put as many lines in as they can carry the harvest on their head. So <laughs> we, 
we do we are aware of some of those things too but anyway to to respond to your question about um, how we integrate gender in our <coughs> programs and how we make those decisions I think we have realized that you need to make gender a focus uh, you of your work and but it's hard to 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 create projects that have it as a central focus because of the stove piping that goes on also among the funding agencies. Mm -hmm. Like you say Tanzania, they have gender as a cross-cutting theme, but the gender officer has no funding on, <laughs> on her own. Mm -hmm. So you always mm -hmm. have to go at it from either the environment group or the, the health group or some other group, so, so it's difficult. With the peace project, we were lucky because we you know, we applied for a grant from the biodiversity theme, uh, team that that um, were interesting in these cross-cutting themes. So, so we managed to get this grant where it really could be in the center. Mm -hmm. And now, for the for the future, um, we are we're looking a little bit more at some uh, private foundations where that might be interested in having gender as in in the center. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that that answered your question, but. We find, we think it's very important, but it's not always that easy to, to find the funding mm -hmm. for it. Yeah, I I, if I could just add, I think I, think, uh, I agree with uh, what you've said, and I think um, Liz, uh, and I know we've talked about this before, I think what gets measured gets done, and so I think, you know, having, because in, in USAID projects, there's, there's the requirement that you have a gender, that there's a gender section in proposals, but sometimes it almost feels like it ends there and that, uh, that there's not enough sort of attention then in projects to making sure that gender gets done and gets measured um, and, and therefore that there's funding that's based on, on, on gender activities. Uh, I think also that uh, we need much more widespread training in gender so that people on projects who are working on projects feel comfortable working on gender because I think sometimes it's sort of considered a specialty that oh you gender people can do the gender can, you know you write that section and you do the work but it really needs to be if it's going to be mainstream or integrated it, it's got to be something that everybody does. Mm -hmm. Michal? I'm Michal Avni from the Office of Population and Reproductive Health at USAID and I, I found the example on the half pearl farming very interesting and the fact that you um, as you started that program you realized you had to overcome the barrier of then having to teach women to swim because they were going in deeper. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, as you were talking about that example, the question that I had in my mind was whether there were any gender norms around menstruation that potentially impacted on this new role of women spending more time in the water and, um, and having to swim and as part of their new form of livelihood. I, I don't think it had a huge impact because it's uh, an activity where you put in you you put in the pearls and you go and put them into the water, but then you don't have to go in every day. So you know you might leave them for two weeks or a month or something. It takes maybe I think nine months or something for the pearl to form. I might be wrong about about that time, but because of that, it it doesn't have. I don't think it has a huge impact. And also because it's a group of women, so if one woman can't go one day, you know, the rest of the group will go out. So was that something that you factored in when you designed the program, when you designed this new intervention? Did you think about norms around menstruation or did it just work out that way that it wasn't a problem? It just worked out that way, yeah. We're, you know, as an environmental planner, that we thought more about what kind of livelihoods could we invest in that would be suitable for that and for that environment and that women could do. Brian, and then Kara. Hi, thanks. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm Brian Greenberg at Winrock International. And um, I, I guess the suggestion, I, I really enjoyed both presentations. Um, the suggestion I want to make is that it's not simply a challenge of integrating gender into a broad range of potential programs where it adds value. Mm -hmm. um, it is, in addition to that, more expanding the definition of what gender means mm -hmm. so that that can inform future generations of program design. A lot of what at least, at least seems to come across as a gender component seems like 
a participation component, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I guess my curiosity is here, how would one want to define gender in the strongest possible terms, say as a comprehensive set of relationships um, across a wide range of identities and social roles in order to promote equity. Otherwise, what you seem to be doing is, or that one seems to, 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 to do, is to identify underserved groups and develop a, a way, a mechanism like women or, or who have faced bias, and of course there are many groups in society additionally that could be defined beyond women, that have faced similar challenges. And my, my, I guess my question for you would be, what, are, what does gender mean here beyond male participation or recruiting women to participate? And how would we demonstrate that including women more systematically is the secret ingredient in success. When I hear about the coastal resource management, it seems that, for example, there are a couple of other important in ingredients, the participatory planning and zoning, for example, vitally important, whoever the beneficiaries and participants are, and conflict mitigation, essential to the, to the success of the whole enterprise. How would you make an argument that the gender dimension of that was of greatest importance. I don't know. I um, it's it was a very long question, so I'm not no, quite sorry. sure how to <laughs> how to answer it. But is your question if you have a if you have a zoning program combined with the livelihood program, what is the gender dimension of those activities apart from just having women participate? Well, at, at the risk of going, <laughs> going on additionally, I think my point is this, that if, uh, if we say that gender means women's participation, we confine ourselves to a fairly limited set of insights about what, how power relationships in society are defined and how they get worked out in economic domains, in the domestic arena, and so forth. So we would want a more, a more powerful vision of gender than simply recruiting women to participate so that it fosters program outcomes that we want. And we would want that to, to be as open and equity oriented across many phases of, 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 of everyday life as possible. How do we make the argument that we are doing that if we stop at participation? And if participation is structured by things like a, a collaborative group zoning process and conflict mitigation, is it that at that level of inclusiveness, the pro that process becomes more important than si or as important potentially as simply including women? How do you make decisions about that? And We can't hear all that great insight that's being talked about at the back of the <laughs> table there. Do you want, Karen, do you want to Yeah, I just want to, I just want to uh, maybe, maybe uh, start the response to this. I think, I think your point is really well taken, and I think as, you know, the more that we try to have multi-sectoral programs that integrate gender, it may be that there are really strong gender norms related to sex, for example, and not such strong ones in the same community related to labor. So I think we can't, there's not just a cookie cutter approach to integrating gender in a country uh, either. But I was struck by what the, the example that Charlie gave in Ethiopia where the women weren't allowed to plow. They got the land, but they weren't allowed to plow. So a gender response rather than getting, uh, you know, women to be able to rent out their land is to have a really good dialogue about why can't women plow? Why can't women plow? You know, and so that's not just getting women's participation, but that's having a true, true dialogue within the community. Where did that practice come from? Is it still needed? Can we change that kind of a gender-related norm? Uh, so I think in a lot of, in a lot of these uh, activities that, that we're involved in, certainly in reproductive health, it's sort of raising awareness among women and among men about how these norms affect their, their own behavior and how the, it affects their own health and the health of their partners and their families. 
but I think you raise a good point. But but again, also, I want to say participation is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with starting with with, with some participation. So absolutely. Kara has been very well, patient. I my question. Oh, there's a microphone. Hi, I'm Kara Honzak from the World Wildlife Fund, and I work on uh, population health and environment projects in several sites. And I, I guess my, I think my question will maybe help answer this question. I'm curious, in some of the projects you've worked on in Tanzania, what strategies you use in your participatory approaches with the communities when you first come in and as you're moving forward to uh, approach and broach the subject of gender and gender integration, and particularly when you're focused on, um, I would assume, transparency of, of your approaches and participatory analysis and um, on transforming relations. I mean, to what degree do you broach that topic and how do you do it? Well, when we go in and, and work in a, in a new community, um, usually what we do is, well, first of all, we always work with Tanzanian colleagues, so it's not actually me you going in and, and starting to work there. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we go in and we meet with, usually start with the village leaders and, and stuff, but then we, you know, we might start if it's a, it depends also on the issue that we're talking about, but we usually do some kind of an issue identification uh, exercise, and then we we meet with uh, both men and women and young people and old people and all the different groups that you know might have an interest. Because I agree, it's not only women who are a disadvantaged group uh, in a mm -hmm. community, and then. Um, we're trying to figure out how, you know, based on the problem we're trying to solve. Is it a zoning scheme? Are we starting with livelihoods? But as I said before, we're trying to um, have kind of a, attack a problem from different uh, directions. And I would say I'm not a gender expert at, by training. I'm an environmentalist. So I think I agree with what you say. I, I'm one of those people who feel like, oh, well, if we're going to talk about gender, maybe can we just invite uh, one of a gender expert to do the talking, mm -hmm. and I'm learning more and more myself to put on the hat myself and and uh, try to discuss discuss both of them. But um, I don't know. Sometimes um, when we go into the villages too, now we've trained our resource management people to go in and and put on the hat themselves. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Michael Swoboda, George Washington University. Um, my actual areas are rhetoric and <laughs> communication, so I'm coming at this from a very different <laughs> angle. Um, but as I listen to you talk, uh, I'm thinking of the theories of a communication scholar by the name of Paul Watzlawick, who actually used therapeutic models of communication, but his, his basic point was there are, si there are systems of communication, and if you're going to work with a, a party within that system, uh, traditionally one works with just the person who's supposed to be affected and cures, quote unquote, their problem. But when they re-enter the system, the system forces them back into the same behavior. Mm -hmm. So you have to destabilize the entire communication system. And it seems to me that at some level you're doing that when you go into these villages. <coughs> I'm curious whether the, the um, kinds of resource management you're talking about are classically tragedies of the commons if they're not uh, handled effectively. Uh, first, I'm wondering whether the, the women actually designate specific plots as their own, or, or, or are they managing these things in common? And did bringing women into the larger conversation about resources help men manage their own communications regarding the commons that they dealt with? So. I see two interventions in the work you're doing. One is you're working as a consultant, and the other is the, the change, changing the patterns of communication within the community, which may then enable them to more effectively manage a tr uh, the, the commons. Well, one, one thing about coastal resources is that because we usually we deal with multiple resources, it's not just uh, like forests or, so, or just a monkey or something it's it's fisheries it's uh, the seaweed farming it's it's all kinds of stuff so it depends mm -hmm. like with seaweed <coughs> farming you know then you tie up the seaweed of, on on the 
on the racks or whatever and you put it in the water and that's an individual resource but with the fishery that's a common resource so it really depends on from from problem to problem mm -hmm. but um, was the half pearl managed as plots or common? that's plots mm -hmm. too because you do you do extract the but the wild harvest of the bivalves is the tragedy of the commons issue so I guess in that instance we're going from a commons to mm -hmm. an individually owned kind of plot thing or it's people it's a group that owns it together but still um, but you know when we w a lot of times we do some kind of a participatory appraisal where we're trying to figure out what the problems are and the one thing we found very useful now is the the theater for development the the interactive shows where you where you bring up the problems in a group of people and I we found it's extremely important to have the village leaders be part of this discussion too so that you bring up the problem and you make people be able to to discuss it and be comfortable talking about a problem because a lot of times the problem exists and everyone kind of knows about it but no one wants to talk about it but then once you verbalize it and it's out on the table then you might be able to change some behaviors question in the back. I apologize if I've missed you here a couple mm -hmm. rounds. That's okay. Uh, Sabira Qureshi, I'm an independent consultant working on gender issues. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take forward the, the previous question there. I know there's been some discussion around it already, but I think what that question did was to really get to the, to the crux of the matter, and um, it leads to the point of unpacking what we mean by gender integration mm -hmm. or gender mainstreaming. Mm -hmm. And these are words that have been used so much that there's been a lot of critique on whether gender has actually been mainstreamed into oblivion. But <laughs> when we talk about um, participation versus integration or mainstreaming, are we just talking about a very short-term project-related activity, or are we going deeper? And there was this initial uh, conceptual talk about transformation versus uh, the other two kinds. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we also have to be aware of the fact that in many parts of the developing world, men and women do lead very segregated lives in terms of their productive roles. Mm -hmm. And just um, trying to change attitudes and behaviors in terms of trying to get them together, to work together, to do. Th I, I think I'm, I'm not sure whether that is the real, whether we've really analyzed what it is that's, that uh, how we would de define the transforming criteria. And I'd like to sort of bring that back to your presentation when you said that projects sometimes are too short to actually measure behavioral change. And I think, to me, a lot of the, uh, problems we've had in terms of eva project evaluations is that they're never able to really measure those behavioral outcomes. Either they're not long enough or the criteria that measure that transformative behavior mm -hmm. change is not clear yet. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to ask, population programs have been around forever, many decades now. When you go in with a new project, knowing that it's going to be a short-term, two to three-year project, max five years. How would you build your m &E system in a way that you have a baseline at that point, but that baseline may be the outcome of another project or several projects that took place many years further back? Is there some way you can possibly ensure the measuring, the measurement of some kind of behavioral attitudinal change that really captures the transformative uh, outcome that one is hoping for and not just the, the other two kinds. B because this is a challenge a lot of uh, monitoring, and many people are, are really struggling with, and a lot of the gender-related outcomes get left out mm -hmm. simply because those, that criteria is not clearly defined. Mm -hmm. No, I think, uh, I think that you make a very good point that transforming gender is a long-term activity, as I said, and sometimes sort of trying to smash into five-year projects that, that can't possibly change a country's gender norms and roles. Um, well, first off, if we had good quali quantitative baselines, rigorous baselines of all projects, in any case, we'd be in be much better shape than we are now. 
Um, but I think, you know, a lot of times we rely on DHS, for example, that has a gender module, but it really doesn't get to transforming gender. So, you know, the, the, the baselines are only as good as the questions that we ask and the methodologies that we use in those baselines. So again, as I was saying, you know, very rigorous. And, you know, even if, you're, even if your baseline is sort of even measuring things that have been done in the last 10 years through various projects, if there's documentation of what was done in, you know, we're talking about gender, in integrating gender, trying to transform gender, in each of those project cycles, then it helps build the story so that you get to 2007 and you do a baseline and you know that it's still based on 10 years of, of good work and you know what the documentation is. So I think, I think there are lots of ways that we as evaluators can strengthen our evaluation methodologies. Okay. Any other comments on that right there? No, oh, Charlie? Just to follow up on that, I want to also ask Karen, in the uh, So What uh, report, you said that the, in the methodology there were 400 RH uh, pro projects you looked at, but you presented <coughs> data only on 25 or 29. Now, does that mean, as uh, this lady was saying, that most of the projects did not have enough good uh, M&E data, outcome data, to uh, for you to for you to analyze. Yes, that's a, that's exactly right. As I said, I'm just going back to my slide to you know to be to, of the 400 that we looked at. The reason we got down to 29 was that the criteria that we had were that they had to have measured reproductive health outcomes, and most projects do that. You know, contraceptive prevalence or some measure of, of outcome. Um, then they had to have undergone a, a rigorous evaluation, either qualitative or quantitative, um, and they had to have integrated gender. So, you know, that, those three criteria got us down to 29. And as I said, I mean, for example, um, the, the Promundo project, there, there were some really good projects that were just not far enough along at that time to include, and that's why we're hoping that we can, that we can update this analysis and that we would have far more than 29. Um, but it is a, it's a big problem. It's a big problem, and, and we evaluate, and I, and I include myself in that category as, a, as an evaluator, have fallen short. Um, you know, we really have a big challenge ahead of ourselves to, to get better documentation and better evaluations. Yeah, I, I think it's um, one of the points that Karen made also struck me, this notion of both the time, having enough time, but also, as you said, in the post-Cairo period, with the integrated programs, a lot of things on the table, it's difficult to ascribe impact to one particular, um, one particular set of interventions or approach to the interventions. And I think that also really does, um, just as kind of isolating the, well, I won't say the magic bullet, but mm -hmm. kind of particularly putting priority on a, a given part of a package. Um, so too is it obviously in this PHE realm so difficult to show the benefit of the package itself right, right, and right, the yeah. fact that it's integrated and um, our temptation, of course, because we are budget and office and expertise organized in silos, our temptation is to want to understand the factors and the interventions and their impact and prioritize them and such in their silos and separate. Uh, but at the same time, part of what I think at least is one underlying assumption of the integrated approach is that that integration itself is greater than the sum of its parts. And so uh, also providing kind of on the flip side, um, not, well, not making the M&E challenge any easier by aggregation as well as by um, kind of what her historically been single sector approaches. And so um, I guess just another plea for <laughs> uh, M&E clarity, innovation, ideas, um, and, and systematic uh, approaches to it. Um, I should say we tried to do a little bit of that and capture some of the work that's been done, um, and I might have said this in our introduction, but we have some reports out there, particularly I'd, I'd point you to uh, John Pielemeyer's focus piece that looked across a number of PHE programs, some funded by aid, some funded by the Packard Foundation, and tried to understand uh, and, and, and really take a hard look at the, um, the m and &E side of the integrated program a a as well. well I, I, do you have a final question, Mary? Yep, go ahead. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, my name is Mary Mullen. and I work with the Bosnia Support Committee. Um, I, was w I was wanting to go back to what the fellow was saying, does, from your projects, does this equal equality and gender 
spill over into the rest of the society. I was wondering about younger children are in school. Do you ever do anything, or do they learn from their mothers because their mothers are integrated? Is how would you approach youth, or do you approach youth? Okay, you said there are a couple youth programs in the ones that you capture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, oh yeah, certainly there are lots of lots of programs for youth. A lot of programs looking at again, you know, age appropriate um, gender gender norms and roles, discussions of gender norms and roles um, in sort of family life education or whatever they, they, the, that sort of genre of, of education happens to be called. A lot of uh, peer education programs, as I said, Jamaica very sort of um, a lot of policy focus on really. Fo uh, focusing on, on young men who or tend to be disadvantaged. So there are lots of programs um, for, for young people. Some of them, there's lots of debate on how, uh, how, uh, how good they are, um, uh, but, but, but there are a lot of activities. There was an interesting study, by the way, in Bangladesh that Ruth Simmons did, and this, I mean, this was from a decade ago, but it always sticks in my mind, and that is that, uh, that young women in Bangladesh, because they, were, they went with their mothers when the family planning workers came to villages and heard the family planning workers talk to their mothers about contraception and, and you know, having the number of children that they, that they felt that they could afford to have, et cetera, et cetera, that that really um, had an impact on the young women and that that really changed th when, when they became of age, of reproductive age that those, those um, uh, impressions that they had gained as, as young girls, just sitting with their mothers, they just happened to be sitting with their mothers, they weren't the focus of any of the information themselves, uh, really changed their behavior sort of a generation later. So, you know, it can make a difference. Well, I, I want to uh, thank you both very much and also thank the audience for some um, sophisticated and erudite questions on, on, on your behalf as well. I think this is um, obviously a critical set of challenges from both how to do it, how to measure it, how to understand the impact, how to do integrated work and, and um, have pop health environment and the gender dimensions um, all at the table from the beginning uh, as well as through the programs and to better understand their effectiveness. Um, I, as I mentioned, we are uh, videotaping the session. We'll have the PowerPoints, the videotape, a meeting summary, perhaps some links to some of the reports that um, were mentioned as well. And then I'll also just say already on the web in all these formats, uh, web, uh, video, and PowerPoint and such, are some of the meetings that Karen referred to, Gary Barker and the Promundo mm -hmm. uh, experience in Brazil, but also as part of the larger um, other, half of, other Half of Gender um, uh, book that the World Bank did where some of those same folks were involved, uh, as well as a series on Islam, gender, and reproductive health where the series of meetings and mm -hmm. um, multiple ways to, to hear about the insights from that. So I urge you all to come to the Wilson Center's um, Environmental Change and Security Program website to capture the